we don't exist as an island, mm. right? So how yeah. do we go back to community led, multidisciplinary, multi prong approaches? Because when someone, as you know, gets pregnant, it's not just the healthcare, it's their job, right? It's their food, it's their housing, it's their safety. And so I'm just saying that to say that there are solutions, but people like quick and fast and easy. Hi, this is Frank Schaefer, and this is a podcast that I do called In Conversation with Frank Schaefer. Uh, It is a live event on Facebook. It is then recorded. You are listening to this as a podcast where podcasts are delivered and or seeing it on YouTube or Facebook or other places. And today we have two people we've had on before. Um, Last time around, the conversation was so good. We felt there was such uh, importance to what our guests were saying that we wanted them back soon. And fortunately, they are. But now I have to apologize because I can barely remember the titles of my own books, let alone names and dates. Uh, So Ernie, my producer, has very kindly put up in the sidebar here something. I wish I could fake read it the way they do off teleprompters and make it look like I really, but I'm going to have to actually look at this and make sure I get all of this straight. So forgive me. Uh, Taya and Karen, because I'm going to read my introduction and make sure I get it all straight. So um, first of all, this is a caregiving forum for Black Maternal Health Week. And that's why we're doing this uh, right now. My guests today are Dr. Taya Stott, MBA, EDD, Chief Innovation Officer in the Office of Impact and Innovation at the Morehouse School of Medicine. So that's one down, good for me. Ernie's proud of me right now. And Dr. Karen A. Scott, MD, MPH, FACOG, and the Chief Black Feminist Physician, Scientist, Founding CEO, and owner of Birthing Cultural Rigor, LLC. Did I get all that right? Yes. Okay. Nailed it. All right, so now I can, my blood pressure will go back down again. (laughs) Um, And we begin this Black Maternal Health Week by honoring uh, Edith Floyd. How is Edith doing? (laughs) She's amazing. She she is uh, the epitome of resilience and grit. And um, sometimes I don't think she realizes um, her her self-worth and her value, not just to her, her daughters and her family, but to many. And I think we saw each other this weekend and she was uh, received with love from people that we grew up, that we love forever. So she's doing great. How old is your mom now, if I may ask? She's 77. Okay. I mean, she's at an age where you're allowed to start asking. You can, you know, when you get- She will be 77 this year. Mm -hmm. She's forgetting about that. She's 77, yep. Good. Mm -hmm. And, And, you know, last time, we won't go into all this again because last time, and by the way, I urge anybody watching to go back into our podcast file and find the first interview with Taya and Karen because it was really wonderful. We had such a good chat about all of our backgrounds and- how are we were made and, and how our parents interacted with us and where we come from and, and Edith and all the rest of it. But that said, um, let's just begin with the subject at hand because talk about maternal health in the context of, uh, you know, what we, what we started with here, which is um, the whole issue of black maternal health. And I just want to note too, how important recent actions taken by the Biden administration are to the future of black maternal health because they seem to have, at least in name, talked about this as an issue. Um, I know the the Biden administration is calling for, and I'm looking at my note again here to get it right, 4.5 million investment in uh, doulas, women who help with birth and so forth. That doesn't seem like much to me, Um, you know, in terms of the kind of money that gets spent on stuff. Where are we at right now with this administration and just what's being done about this. Let's talk about that, but also give it some context in terms of black maternal health, in terms of the problems that have not been addressed and the history of those problems. So I'm gonna let you both just please jump in here and and give us the information we need and help us just get a perspective on this whole issue. Sure, Um, I will will, will do, I will start with some contextualization. So this is the fifth annual, observation celebration of Black Maternal Health Week. And this 
kind of movement to do this at the national level can be credited to the Black Mamas Matter Alliance, which is in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, it started 2017, if I do my math correctly. And the reason was to bring to the national forefront, right? The national forefront, that doesn't mean that we weren't already having these conversations for decades and centuries, right? In the community grassroots level, but bring to the national forefront attention to the disproportionate rates of death and dying among Black mothers, and we say birthing people because we recognize and honor that not everyone that gives birth identifies as a woman or a mother. So we are explicit in saying Black mothers and birthing people, um, and that those disproportionate rates of almost dying or nearly dying around pregnancy, labor, birth, postpartum, all the way up until the first year after birth. Mm -hmm. Again, a disproportion happening to Black birthing communities and Indigenous communities. We are focusing specifically around Black communities um, because we've seen even when, and I say we, when I say we, I speak we collectively around public health scientists, um, nurse scientists, physician scientists, epidemiologists, policymakers, um, research folks, like the collective we, when we look at the data and we control, right, or try to equalize factors such as um, insurance status, income, education level, marriage status, um, utilization of, of prenatal care, zip code, the, the level of the hospital care, meaning the level of the neonatal intensive care unit um, for that hospital that determines sometimes the acuity or the specialization of care. Mm -hmm. We look at all those factors and we control for them and try to equalize for them. It does not help or it does not address for the glaring gaps that we see, right? We see these inequities because they're not just disparities or differences. They're inequities because they're avoidable and preventable. 60% of all the deaths are preventable. Mm. And we also know that for every one person that dies, 100 people almost die. Mm. And so we have these trends around, yes, people don't have insurance. People don't have access to care. Um, closures of obstetrical units. So in urban communities and suburban communities and rural communities where entire units Right, those who are trained and specialized in supporting someone who's pregnant or laboring or birthing or postpartum, um, those units are being closed. And so there's all types of factors that are impacting how people can truly access and engage and pay for, right, um, for care based upon their need. But what we're seeing is this epidemic of not listening to, of dismissing, of ignoring of delaying care or determining the quality of care that a hospital staff, clinicians, physicians, nurses, staff, security, everyone, they determine their responsiveness of care to their own kind of interpretations of that person's value or worth. I, I wanna just jump in on one thing here because you know, the last time we talked in the, in the podcast we did before, and again, Everybody listening to this, look, this, the, these are very important issues. And I'm talking to two wonderful, incredibly qualified guests. Uh, go back and listen to the other interview. But one mm -hmm. of the things that stuck, and it has a lot to do with what you're saying now, is the history of this didn't start yesterday. And I'm still gobsmacked by something you detailed last time to me that I didn't know anything about. And that was that the history of the white kind of OBGYN science, if you want to put that way, as it developed in the South, was directly related to the delivery of the safe delivery of babies to slave masters so they could have more slaves, and that they worked with doctors to try to, you know, make that happen. You know, I'm still trying to get my head around that. And I'm and I guess I want you to recap that a little bit, but then fast forward, because I think that what we need to understand is that this lack of proper care and these horrible statistics in terms of black women dying and being hurt in perfectly preventable situations, you know, this has a long history mm -hmm. and um, 
we need to be aware of that. So I just wonder if you can put that together for me. So like, so yes, yes, yes. And it is very important, right? So, so history is important and, it, and how, and history is important because it demonstrates, right, that these are not new problems. And, and it also demonstrates the continuation of historical atrocities in our healthcare systems that are reminiscent of what was happening in antebellum, postbellum slave period time. So what Frank is referring to is right that we know that Slave, enslaved people were imported into this country. And so in 1808, there was an act of Congress that you could stop importing enslaved people, right? People, Africans to enslave them. Well, when you stop importing human beings that we were then experimenting, exploiting for labor, right? For the economy, then when you can't bring in new human beings, you then produce new human beings. Mm -hmm. So dating back from the 16th, 17th century, Virginia and onward, we have what we call reproductive control and dominance, right? Mm -hmm. We, the partnerships between plantation owners and slave owners. And at that time, physicians, OBGYNs, that partnership allowed for the not only production of labor, the labor force, but production of the laborers, right? And so you have reproductive injustice, control, dominance. Think about it in this way, that the most valuable enslaved Black person was like a teen, a very fertile teen girl on the auction block that had demonstrated their capacity to get pregnant multiple times and to then give birth, mm -hmm. and then to have their bodies and their ability to parent, to love, to nourish, to feed, to partner, to marry, like all those things controlled by entire state governments, communities, leaders, right, for continuing a slave economy. And so those, that value of that young enslaved Black teen girl, then look at state policy now, well, everything's about preventing teen pranks. I'm just making an example that like the very mm -hmm. people's lives that we valued and su supported or protected, right? When enslaved people were beaten and they were pregnant, there were holes dug in the ground to protect the property, which was mm -hmm. the fetus, while they still beat, right? And, and control the minds and bodies of people. And so we have to look at contemporary day policies around like the involvement of child protective services, incarceration, right? Like all of those things stem back to when you free a community that you then could control their existence and their reproduction. And now that they're free autonomous agents, what are the ways that you continue to control them even though they are free? And so what we hope that we can demonstrate to folks is that there is a, um, an ideology in our country of the one group, right, mm -hmm. that is deserving to be pregnant mm -hmm. and to, get, to not only get pregnant, but to sustain their pregnancy and then to have a birth that is safe and autonomous and joyful and pleasurable and familial. And then That's to right. be able to live beyond that birth as the parent and the child in a dyad within a greater community. There are only mm. two groups that get that right actualized, right? In the life, was it life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Mm. It is, there are white people in our country and Asian people in our country. And I don't say that to be me, sure. it is the truth, that is the data. Those are the groups that are flourishing when it comes to sustaining their vitality and their viability as communities in our country. Mm. And that does not happen for black birthing communities when we have at the national rate, at least a three to four disparity or difference between who gets to live. But in some states, that number is as high as eight times mm. or 12 times, right? So though we are the United States, where you live does determine, right, your capacity mm. um, to get pregnant, to stay pregnant and to birth and whether you birth at home or in a birthing center or at a hospital, like you get to, you should be able to choose mm. how you do that. And that's not happening, particularly for black mothers and birthing people. Yeah. And Taya, Frank, uh, can I, jumping, I want to go back. Can I yeah, go back I wanted you to, to jump in there, Taya. On, on, yeah, with, so, on, so you on. talked about what the Biden administration is providing as far as um, to maternal health. I want to go back to a broader, 
cost. And when you look at the cost of uh, healthcare, it's $4.1 trillion. When you look at maternal morbidity, according to Commonwealth, about 32.3 billion is spent totally on maternal morbidity. Yeah. So let's put that in perspective when we talk about why, why cost matters, why the investment matters, and then looking at what the outcomes are today and, and what, what Dr. Scott or what Scotty is saying. And to me, that's troubling when you talk about the, the United States um, and, and the cost that's disproportionately affecting people of color mm. and those who have social uh, disadvantages. I think that speaks largely to what um, Karen is talking about is, is the cost and, 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 and the means they don't, they don't meet. You know, one thing I'd like to just jump in before I forget to ask this, to kind of give us a, a good perspective on the whole issue. Taya and, and Karen, between the two of you, um, can you come up with an example? And it could be as much as just one local hospital somewhere or something you all are involved with that kind of sets a higher bar where we say, hey, you know, if it could only be like this one hospital we can point to, or this one county in Michigan, some example where someone or some group has effectively managed to show at least a glimmer of hope of, look, here's how it could be. I know we've got bad examples because you were saying, hey, it goes from four times to eight times to even higher on the bad end. Is there any place we can look at in the country and say, look, you know, if you're a black woman who's pregnant and having a child, you'll be lucky to be in this community because they put it together or is the, is the picture grim everywhere? I'm just wondering if we can get examples and that'll give us a little bit of a way to look at how to dig ourselves out of this. Do you have examples? So I, me? I, you know, I'm gonna let Karen answer that to the fullest. I'm gonna say this about Morehouse School of Medicine. Mm -hmm. So we were founded to diversify the healthcare workforce. That means respectful care, culturally competent individuals who are infused in communities, rural communities, urban areas, to really improve um, health and health outcomes. And so to have healthier mothers, healthier children, healthier families, healthier uh, birthing people is what the Center for Maternal Health Equity does at Morehouse School of Medicine. And that relates to women's health and building bridges to community engagement, as well as advocacy. Um, so that means innovative, respectful care with people that look like you who are serving you and who are there to make that impact. And so I would say that we're moving towards that mark by the diversification of the workforce, but also by the approach that we use from a community engagement doula approach mm. to make certain that you have a variation of folks at the table to improve that experience uh, for that mother and for that child. Does that get into the issue? My, my producer, Ernie, just took a note up uh, about uh, birthing friendly hospital designation. In other words, is this, because you're talking about doulas, happens that a friend of mine that I uh, meet every day in the playground when I pick up my granddaughter at, at school, who's in second grade, and one of the moms there is a doula. So we talk all about that. And she just had her third baby and and I get kind of some doula perspective on life and, and birthing. And I'm just curious if the birthing friendly hospital designation, you know, could be extended to Morehouse. And if you see some, some difference in the, in the statistics um, where like we now see that those numbers are better in those communities because of this, 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 and the other, you know, are there some specifics we can get into on that? Mm, I, so, so this is challenging to answer. And so I'm just going to be really <laughs> explicit is, about it. It's so when I when I shared that when you control for factors such as the person, the individual level factors, so income, education, zip code, optimal prenatal care utilization, marriage sure. status, all those things. If after we control for those things and the gap still exists mm. around death or dying. And in the studies, the, 
the phenomenon that's being measured, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. change when I control for those factors. It means the things that I study and the things that I aim to study or examine in that study didn't contribute to the phenomenon that's happening. Mm -hmm. So right. I'm going to go out and just say, because I work for myself, that no, yeah. <laughs> there's no hospital that has figured that's out right. in this country mm -hmm. how to truth how to do this with truth and trust and transparency mm. and i say do this how to honor mm. right and acknowledge and affirm the humanity and the dignity the power the purpose the passion the potential and promise of a black woman or a person with capacity for pregnancy and reproduction and mystery all those things like you have to acknowledge that we are human beings first mm -hmm. and that we are deserving of you responding to us when we come for help. And because the quality of care varies within an institution based on how the e emergency room or the clerk or the registrar or security or the chaplain or the charge nurse or the attending mm -hmm. physician, it all varies on individuals within a a, a unit, a department responding to people if they are black or white, if they are rich or poor, if they are heterosexual or not heterosexual, if they achieve their pregnancy through IVF, right? A test tube, when you say test tube babies in the 80s, that's not a problem saying that like, we are responding to people with biases, but people understand biases, but it's not a bias or belief that kills, it's an unchecked language and mm -hmm. behavior, an unchecked imbalance of power where those who have access to either a social or a medical capital, like I can't even get treated well in the hospital. And I went to the emergency room during COVID. I called my sisters and my mom on the phone because I was being treated the way the narratives of how society views Black people. I was Black. I was 45. They thought I was on drugs. They thought I was pregnant and didn't know. So I'm telling you, I'm having the neurological symptoms. I'm using the language that you use because I'm a trained physician and you are humiliating me. You're gaslighting me. You're dehumanizing me. You're like, oh, you say you're a doctor. You say stuff like this. Yeah. Treated, right. I can't even imagine. And I have medical and social capital. Hmm. Right? right. So imagine going into the hospital and no one even believes you because they've already been indoctrinated to think about black folks as dress seekers, as drug but, users, Yeah, as question I have for, for either of you to jump in on. I have two questions and I'm going to mention them both. And Ernie, just try to remember this so when I've forgotten what the other one is, you put a note up for me. Um, one question is that are there other aspects of medical practice as they impact the black community, people of color, both male and female that shed some light on this because I know intuitively and maybe because of the little reading I've done that this is not just a problem reserved for the way black women who are pregnant are treated. This is a problem across oh, the board. Yeah, so of course, it? obviously it isn't just about the, that one issue. But the other thing I wanna know is have there been any comparative studies for instance in France or the national health system in the UK or Canada in which there are also populations mm. that are minority and of color, where we can see that in the non-United States background with our history, mm -hmm. um, where, where people are getting uh, better treatment or there are better outcomes that are measurable. So those are, those, those are kind That's of complicated both questions. Right. Well, they're yeah. not they're complicated, but they're also nuanced, right? Like, so what yeah. you're describing is medical racism, right? Yeah. So that the, 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 the treatment or the evaluation of care is based on how the system responds to someone's race, which I just say is racism because our sure. race is that determine, right, the quality of care that we get, but we know that happens. That's really racism. That the, what I hear you're asking, right, is, well, in other countries where there are racial or ethnic differences, you have to remember in our country, we use the skin color, yes. right? We use skin color to determine a hierarchy of human value. And it's not just healthcare, it's any system. It's, it's right. education, it's housing, all of those things. And so when other countries are contacting Dr. Donna Ian Davis, who's, who developed obstetric racism on how to translate right, her work 
in other countries where if it is a predominantly white government and there are non-white people in the country, they may not say skin color. It may be um, uh, different groups of people. It may be tribalist nativity. So mm -hmm. I just want to put out that that in my response to say there's no hospital is because hospitals are still governing within systems and structures right. of oppression, right? That devalue us. There are community led right, organizations and entities. There are doulas and midwives. There are black grand midwives who have been doing this work for centuries, right? And it's the field of obstetrics and gynecology that try to eradicate them for the professionalization and medicalization of birth is down to dollars, right? How do you benefit from a birthing population? And so when there are when there is racial and cultural concordance of care between mm -hmm. the provider and the patient, even if we just looked at gender, right? There's data that says women physicians are actually have better outcomes than male physicians, right? Yes, yeah. Right? I mean, so the data is there showing that, I'm just gonna put it out there, that the non cisgendered white man, if he is not in control, then other populations who don't identify in that way actually have better experiences and better outcomes. Right. And in community-led initiatives, like a community-led clinic, if it's a federally health, you know, federally qualified health center or mm. a rural health center, but even community-led birthing centers or community-led um, uh, practices to support home birth, it's really, it's not being in the system right, where everyone is indoctrinated to train you inappropriately and the processes of accountability continue to fail, right? Mm -hmm. They're not right. measuring the right things. Yeah, right? You are not naming and then providing meaning and then measurement to then monitor and then modify. Like those are all the failures of our existing quality improvement. Like how do you improve upon things? Mm -hmm. So I do wanna say there have been advances and improvements in technology. But if your fundamental ethics or ethos is grounded mm. in saying there are certain characteristics that there are certain characteristics that then I guess like say legitimize preferential treatment or differential treatment, mm -hmm. then that's the problem. So there are our community initiatives. I can say um, the Birthing Center for Equity. I'm thinking on them, but Kimberly Durden and Alexia, like they're in LA. There's choices in Memphis, Tennessee. There's common sense. Um, Jenny Joseph is times one of the times women of the year, person of the year in Florida. Again, when black women, black led initiatives mm -hmm. are allowed, permitted to mm -hmm. operate out of love, right? Like we don't pathologize our community. And when you are trained in the medical system and nursing system to say race is, is a biological construct or that you pathologize your behavior, then it's easy to say, well, here are your risks. And then if you have these risks, let's eradicate that disease. And it ends up being, right? So I'm saying that to say that there are success stories. Mm -hmm. um, it is the lack of investment in those success stories, the lack of sustainability, the lack of, of replicating models of care and services where we know communities have done really well. In. And not only the, the patient as the consumer, but the the workers, right? When the workforce yeah. also feels valued, right? And That's they right. feel that there is democracy or there's autonomy or there's shared power in decision-making, then we see better outcomes for not only the person seeking the care, but the person or entity providing the care. And then it goes back to what you're saying around policy administration, 4 million, I'm like, no. we, it's not a lot, right? It's community birth workers, community health workers, perinatal support <laughs> people, they have been in our community, serving our communities, even before people yeah. get pregnant, right? They're yeah. in the home, they're in the church, they're, I mean, they're, they're in the barbershops, they're in the salons, right? It's all about those social structure determinants mm -hmm. of health. Like, how do we go beyond investing in individual level interventions when we know we don't, we don't exist as an island, mm -hmm. right? So how yeah. do we go back to community led multidisciplinary, multi prong approaches, because when someone, as you know, gets pregnant, it's not just the healthcare, it's their job, right? It's their food, it's their housing, it's their safety. And so I'm just saying that to say that there are solutions, but people like quick and fast and easy. And um, we have to really look at 
listening to the community around their experiences of mm-hmm. care. And I think that's what we're learning with Black Maternal Health Week, that stories matter. Yeah. There's stories behind the statistics and there's meaning behind having community involved, right? In the design, right? From design to dissemination, what would it look like if a hospital were to actually ask feedback from the people who were consuming right. Right, the care? Clients, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, 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 and speaking from lived experience, having mm-hmm. lost a child um, mm-hmm. at a time and being you know, in, in a church setting, you often are criticized, well, well, why did you use it, lose a child? Was there something that you did? Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you think back on that and then you finally hear the story of a mother or someone that has gone through the same thing, but that, that's that been shamed to talk about their experience. And I can remember having my youngest daughter uh, with insurance, right? Best insurance, mm-hmm. decided to go to a neighborhood that wasn't my neighborhood and my physician uh, a person of color wasn't there. And I was trying to, to breastfeed my, my youngest daughter. And they were saying, oh, um, you're doing something wrong. And I've done this very well before. And mm. it wasn't a person of color that was telling me that I was doing it wrong. And all of a sudden, my gynecologist, a person of color came in and said, oh, this baby's having this reaction. Let's, let's airlift her to the system in St. Louis. And mm. immediately there was a responsiveness that I'd never seen. And so just think about people who aren't in healthcare, who don't know the buzzwords, who don't know uh, what their bodies are telling them that's happening. And I think that that's another thing that the um, administration could look at is not only the stories that people can tell, Mm -hmm. but also what have been those positive outcomes, because regardless of race, um, class, um, sexism, there are issues from people who really don't dig deep to find out what the root cause is. And you're right, the accountability piece mm-hmm. for the healthcare system is it's really it needs to be revisited because mm-hmm. uh, value-based care, what does that really mean? You know, what does that mean in the scheme of things? And so I can just tell you there are many people out there that won't ask the questions, that won't say, no, I know what I'm doing. How can you get me some help or how can you get my baby some help? Can yeah, I advocate? And, advo- and advocate for themselves as well. That's, Let me just say right. this is uh, in conversation with Frank Schaefer, mm-hmm. a podcast that you can watch and or listen to where podcasts are are, are heard. Um, today, I am talking with two guests who we've had before. Um, one is Dr. Taya Scott, and uh, the other is her sister, um, and that is Dr. Karen Scott. Uh, the conversation is is about black maternal health, but uh, more than that, it's about the history of the United States. I wanna ask you both a question that I'm gonna throw out there in a very weird way. Um, I don't know how else to put this. I don't know enough to ask the questions that you think I ought to be asking. I want you to tell me what those questions should be for the second half of this podcast. Taya, let me start with you. If I knew as much as you did about this issue, which will not happen, um, what would I be asking you now that would get me the answer that we really need to be hearing, not based on my ignorance, but based on what ought to be talked about? And then I'm going to ask Karen exactly the same thing. I'd like you to tell me what you would like to be saying that needs to be heard most, not fishing around, you know, trying to get the right question from me. Answer Mm -hmm. the question you wish I had asked. Voting in your community matters. The people that you put in place to represent you in your counties and locally matters because in order for this to change, policies have to be transformed and you have to have the right people in the seats who are representing you. I've lived in a rural county in Kentucky And I can tell you that we had to travel from Kentucky to Nashville to get good health care, women's care. Mm -hmm. And so, again, understanding the people that are representing you and the needs of the people in those communities and that understand those needs in the community. That sounds very simple, Mm -hmm. but until health care leaders 
and organizations step up to the plate. Uh, your Blue Cross Blue Shields of the world is a great example of, of what they're doing for Maternal Health Week, but others step up to the table and they transform some of these policies and the way that they construct healthcare mm -hmm. um, is, is going to be transformational. So again, I, I would just say that, that that's important in my line of work from being a healthcare administrator is, is, is the power of the vote and, mm -hmm. and advocacy for people um, that can't speak for themselves or who don't have mm -hmm. the tools or resources to speak for themselves. We talk about innovation, respectful care, but you have to have someone that's representing you that, that really gets that lived experience. Mm -hmm. Can some of that advocacy in terms of uh, the extension of your logic on voting for the right people also apply to people who are working within corporations on other issues of equity, gender equity, and so forth, get them to start asking the right mm -hmm. questions to their corporations saying, hey, if we have you know, an awareness of this issue, we have, we have black women working for us, mm -hmm. they're going into the medical system, what are we doing to help them Another kind of a voting. What do you think about that, uh, Taya? I mean, is that also something that that people within the corporate world, employing hundreds of millions of people around the globe, could be doing in terms of asking questions they're not asking right now, hard questions about they're, healthcare that's being given to their employees, or, or the investment in education of people mm -hmm. of color. You mm -hmm. have a significant number of African American folks that apply to medical school. And when you look at 10 people, one in 10 are mm. people of color. So when you're talking about the communities that they're serving and the people that have these chronic diseases and, need, and needs, you know, how is the investment to uh, those folks who come from low incomes, who are, who are at that lower quintile of, 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 of income become or, or be prepared for this pipeline of medicine, or how do we introduce them to that? I, you know, I think further down the pipeline, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not a, an MD like Karen, but I know that the power of investment in having internships and practicums and seeing day to day and being exposed is really important. And I think that those are the other ways that we can invest is in the pipeline of individuals who aspire to be, who can't see themselves there, but they see others that can be there. How can we invest in, in those individuals? And I think that that's another way that, that that's what you know, we do at Morehouse School of Medicine. We don't, our own, we don't own our own hospital, but we do look at cognitively diverse individuals who just haven't been exposed enough in their science and in their mathematics and engineering components. And we bring them into a place where they see people that look like them, who believe in them and who know the art of possibility. And I think that that's key when we're talking about this whole issue of care and compassion. And Karen, just to go back to you, um, let's just say you were writing the questions that you want to be asked saying, gee, if, he, if only they would ask me this, so that I could talk about it. What would that question be on this issue? What is the what is the right question to ask that gets the best answer in terms of leading us to the next step, whatever that is, or opening our minds to something? Just tell me um, what I should be asking you about this that would really that really resonates with the truth out there, not my conception of what that truth may be. Those are two different things. Right. Right. Well, uh, thank you for asking me. I, I, I don't know if it's one question, right? And well, give me a dozen, whatever you want. Well, but like, and I don't know, if, and I'm not acting like I know all things, but I think one of the things that it is like, what is your truth, right? So I tell people like, if I were to speak to a health plan, a, a health plan, the CEO, I'm going to just name them, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Ed and all of them, a health plan, a CEO of a hospital. And we got the CEO of a hospital, the CEO of a health plan, um, and then the CEO or the president of a funder. So a funder, a health plan, a hospital, a state perinatal quality care collaborative. Um, if I got them in one room, I would ask them, what does your data say about your intentions mm -hmm. towards um, advancing justice and accountability for black mothers and birthing people? That's my first question. What does your data say about your intent but also your impact. 
So That's let's look right. at your intent and your impact. And then the second question will be, well, then what is your truth? Not what you want it to be. What does your data actually say about your impact in advancing both justice and safety and value and quality and accountability? What does it say about your ethics, right? Because people, you know, pe people get in these conversations, people want to dream. I think it's it, beautiful to aspire and to be aspirational. I'm like, what is your impact? Because if you have a vision statement and a mission statement that has the words quality and equity and justice or hope, but your impact shows that you disproportionately favor one group and then exclude or undermine or erase, um, experiment or exploit or extract another group, hmm. and that group where that you are disproportionately imposing experimentation, exploitation, extraction on is also the group that is disproportionately dying or almost dying, then your vision or mission statement are not true. Mm -hmm. It is performative. So then I'm gonna go back and say, well, then let's explore your ethics. Like what are your beliefs? What's guiding you to do what you do? Who's in your leadership? Mm -hmm. What knowledge do they have outside of like medicine and nursing? What do they represent history? social science, anthropology, public health, faith, or spirituality, right? And then what's informing your science? Because if we can understand the institutional ethics and their leadership and their knowledge, then we kind of get a sense of the science that they're using. Are they using like true evidence or race-based science, right? Are they manipulating, exploiting, or spinning the data to make them look better as opposed to yeah. You truly aren't keeping our community safe, mm. right? There comes the truth part and the transparency. And then it goes back to your measurement strategies. What variables are you using to examine the phenomenon? I give an example mm. of adverse child experiences. When that was created, Kaiser Permanente, California, it was an affluent population with insurance, but it was asking adults to think back to their childhood of a trauma. And then us linking to see if a Recall, recall of a childhood adverse experience is associated with a health problem. And we mm. know that exists. Right. But, you, but, but when you, when not you, when a system finds a valid measure and just systematically imposes it, imposes that measure on all populations without mm. historical context, without theoretical or ethical context, then you have the phenomenon that's happening where like the ACEs look at marriage. And if there is divorce, then that's a child experience. But in, in my community, marriage is not a huge phenomenon. Then you're going to underestimate my trauma. So when this Black man pediatrician, I forget his name in Philadelphia, actually asked urban Black youth to reexamine that measure, they were like, it's not marriage. It's not divorce. It's do I have two adults in the household who are responsible and capable of providing care for me? So when I ask about the presence of two adults versus marriage, mm. and I then, right, I'm now realizing that, that we've used a value of marriage over yeah. two adults in a household that love and nurture and care for a child. Mm. And so my example of this is just showing that how we are imposing our values on our ethics, on our measurements, right? Mm -hmm. And then on the data, and not that values are not important, they are important, but if your value excludes right, a phenomenon that is of value to another community, you miss the opportunity to understand what that, what that community is experiencing as an oppression, or you're missing the ability to see their resilience and their resistance. So my whole thing with Black Maternal Health Week is like, what are you looking at, right? Like what mm -hmm. lens are you using to examine the death and dying gap? And is that lens reproducing the lie that we are biologically inferior right. right and then are you using measures that continue to say we're, we're we're dying and we're almost dying as opposed to no we are resilient we are building community we are and you know we are activating our mothers and our grandmothers and our fathers to be doulas we are right like we are creating other ways of being hmm. to fill in the gap that those systems that get money to do these things are failing us. So I'm always looking at the ethics, the leadership, the knowledge, the science, what yeah. you're measuring, who informed that measure, 
right? Was it from those in power, those in community? And then how do you bring community voices into the work? If we continue to invest in those with power, then those with power continue to do better. And that's mm -hmm. one of the problems of quality improvement is that it has, we don't have an entity that requires us to go to those whose voices have been suppressed or shamed or silenced to get the solutions. We think if I'm in power, I have it all, but that's- Well, or, or to, to your point, to get them to help you phrase the questions. That's right. That are what you were talking about, you know, that give us the real question about the two adults in the household. I would say not give, but like invest in them. Like they should, yeah. and I'm only saying that because People will then go out and be like, oh, let's have community advisory boards. No, no let's, right. let's no. value that people are experts, right? Just differently. There are patient mm -hmm. experts, That's there right. are content experts, there are community experts. Fund them at the level that you fund an academic institution because we all bring our brilliance to the table and it's going to require yeah. all of our brilliance, right? To get a fuller, more robust rigorous picture mm -hmm. and you can't exclude folks just because you don't want to hear that you're hurting them like that's the thing is that people are yeah. comfortable talking about the harm and the hurt mm -hmm. yeah so then get we're silenced yeah and, and, and the shame and and it goes back to what what you were saying about yeah. the measurement health equity is being measured now but what mm -hmm. does that really mean mm -hmm. in the scheme of things when we talk about uh, the experience when we talk about actually accountability and then going back, you know, we're talking about incentivizing and these healthcare plans, mm -hmm. who's capturing that information and who's aggregating that data mm -hmm. and how okay. they're, how are they using that data yeah. to not just inform, but to make the right decisions with those at-risk populations. And uh, I think does, that that's, I have a question for, for, for you, Tay. I'm sorry, I'm not interrupting you, but oh, no. I just want to get this in. And um, how do you um, transition from what you're talking about from what obviously, when it comes to a lot of posturing on these issues, has been a sort of a virtue signaling that doesn't really go to the root of the problem? And that gets back to what Karen was talking about with you know, the motivation and how you see this in, in moral terms as well. But how? I guess I'd put it this way, at Morehouse, where I know you're doing a lot of this work, how do you transition from the virtue singling on a corporate level, say, or a governmental level, to the kind of things that need to actually happen to bring real change? For, first of all, I guess, to change the attitude so that the people who are virtue signaling actually say, wait a minute, I'm not just going to virtue signal anymore. I want to really get answers to the questions from the people who know how to ask them, and we're going to actually do something. I mean, what's the transition there? Because yeah, so, um, so, I think so both, you know, these, this is the question, I think. Yeah, the, the question, so, so that, that's a great question and, and, it's, and it's an ecosystem, right? We, we recognize that there are many different things that we have that, that, that are in our communities and, and, and that we have access to or we don't. And the way we approach it at Morehouse School of Medicine, we're a school that's less than 50 years old. So we have to build partnerships mm -hmm. and extend ourselves beyond Morehouse School of Medicine with people because health equity is this buzzword. It's this hot topic now. The pandemic has lifted the curtain on racism, sexism, classism, you name it. And so we have recognized that we work with, we do grass roots, grass tops mm -hmm. uh, work. Uh, locally, we also understand that the students that we support go back into the community that we serve within Georgia. So, mm -hmm. I mean, who know, who has heard of 60 plus percent of your students staying within the state? That's an economic driver. Mm -hmm. So how do we use that driver to sustain uh, what we're trying to do with health equity and to scale it? And, and the way is through, through partnerships uh, that we are trying to bridge with Fortune 100 companies, but also it's the philanthropy mm -hmm. that's not enough to sustain it. So how do we build capital mm -hmm. and how do we have that investment? And Karen, you know, context matters. Uh, you know, she talked about the historical piece to that. We talk about um, slavery piece, we, we get to the Flexner report, we get mm -hmm. to the reason behind medical education and the transformation of medical education and what that means mm -hmm. with clinical research, 
community-based participatory research. So the, the answer is, is that we have the answer and the solution, but how do you replicate that and, and who will invest and who is making health equity, not just a, a line item at mm -hmm. this moment, but it's a continual mm -hmm. investment in health equity. I think that that's what we're saying when we talk about sustainability, that it's not just a one-off partnership. And we're looking at people that have the same value proposition yes. as we have. Yep. And that's, that's important, integrity, knowledge, mm -hmm. innovation, wisdom, mm -hmm. uh, you know, impact, empathy, belonging. How do I feel that I belong yeah. uh, in my community and where, I, where I'm placed mm -hmm. and where I, where I work, where I go to church? How do you make me feel that I'm valued in that, in that setting? And I think that that's, yep. that's the key that we're talking about here. And can I add to what Tay is saying is that like our call to like philanthropy, right? Like philanthropists do a, have lots of control in setting the tone. Mm. And so again, it, it, it's, a, it's a hierarchy of not only human value, but it's knowledge construction value. We have to dismantle the narrative. And I'm just gonna, that only white men have the knowledge and like aptitude to do rigorous work. And rigor becomes a trigger word. And so people, when they look at teams are not led by white men or not led exclusively by, by exclusively white teams or by academic institutions that are predominantly white led. I was told that just as early as 2019, that if you lead this work and you lead it with other black women, what about the rigor? And that's a, that's a you know, that's a, that's a way that people then tried to deny investment in black led or black women led um, industries or businesses or companies because there's, and I'll put it this way, if our country trusted black women to actually nurse and right, mm -hmm. breast their own children mm -hmm. that were white, then why don't you think we are capable of breastfeeding our own families? Mm -hmm. And so the the right translation of that to present day mm -hmm. is that within our own homes and communities, we have the solutions to help ourselves. It's not reverse racism. It's not even segregation because segregation already exists. We don't, right? It already exists in healthcare access, utilization, even in medical education and training. Mm -hmm. So the ongoing kind of, it is like the demoralization um, and the undermining of like the, the value of black led or racial concordant work, that's a part of like the, um, the dog whistle, right? Like that's what sure. people do to undermine the work that we're already doing in community or through community partnerships. So then like for me, I work exclusively with black, black populations, black teams. Mm -hmm. And then someone says, well, what about white people? And I'm like, that's, that's important. When I look at the data, that particular group is not leading when it comes to disproportionate race, rates of death and dying. It doesn't discount someone who dies who is white, but I'm saying in terms of the disproportionate sure. repetition of this. And so then it, I say to investors, the degree to which an inequity, right, is, is met or achieved, if there's an eightfold disparity or difference then invest by eightfold right like that's give right. where it needs to be given those who are in need sure sure and that's all that means is like just again your intent and your impact we can't continue to to fund those who already have while mm. we're continuing to ignore and underfund or erase or exclude those who do not have who don't have yeah. and um and it is it's about power it's about leadership and decision making and so how do we invest and do it because we're, we are driven by equity or some sense of a morality that yeah. community-led solutions are viable and they're sustainable and they're rigorous and they're meaningful. There's yeah. nothing inferior to community-led um, initiatives or solutions. So that's what I'm also hoping that Black Maternal Health Week does is that it brings more attention to the existing community-led birthing centers or home birth practices or lactation consultants 
um, because we are having to turn internally because the system itself does not, by its own data, does not want to see us thrive. Yes. Um, right. And, yeah. and, and sustain ourselves. Yeah. And cast the definition of data and rigor in a way that's excluding mm-hmm. people just by the way it's phrased mm-hmm. frame, yeah. before mm-hmm. the discussion even starts. I just think exactly. that's a huge, a huge thing that you've right. just touched on. Yeah. And it's all about, you know, Karen talked about it is the pursuit of happiness and, mm-hmm. and it's H-A-P-P-Y, right? So as we're talking about birthing people or people like Chris Gardner, who, mm-hmm. who, who starred in this movie mm-hmm. and fought through a, a lot of uh, homelessness and other things, but finally received that pursuit. So it's all about the quality mm-hmm. of life. That's, that's the end goal, I think, that we're talking about. Yeah, we and have we all are deserving to having that's right the life that we envision and dream, right? There isn't sure. one way to be happy or one way of liberty or one no. way of life, right? And so we're just saying that like we all deserve to reach our optimal, right? Optimal heights and maybe even go beyond that. But that's if right. at the onset, right, at pregnancy in the womb, <laughs> there's a whole <clears throat> population of people who can't even go beyond the womb yes go beyond beyond the first year of life that says a lot right and so I'm just hoping that we offer a different way of thinking about this where we Mm -hmm. don't reinforce individual blame or mother blame like we don't say oh because she and I'm going to use some probably not nice language but like she was a crackhead like now we say oh we have the opioid epidemic but they were crackheads in the 80s and right in 70s. Sure. Like we have extended a level of grace and dignity and empathy. We mm. have higher quality improvement initiatives for the opioid disorder. Mm. That's right. Yeah, and no, all, the fam- right, all the families that we've incarcerated and locked up and sure. separated over generations because one group was seen as, as the capacity to change mm. and that it was a disease right? Mm-hmm. That addiction is disease as opposed to addiction as an innate attribute, right? So just the reframing. So as Tay was saying earlier, like the, the, the strategies are important. I'm always going to go back, well, then what's the theories and ethics driving your strategies? That's mm-hmm. right. If you fundamentally believe something is wrong with us, then it's going to fail no matter how many billions of dollars you put in it, into it, because fundamentally, you see us as as pathology, right? Mm-hmm. As opposed to power and promise and potential. You don't see our humanity. Mm-hmm. And that's what's been most um, disheartening for me is the erasure, the ongoing erasure mm-hmm. and exclusion of our humanity mm-hmm. in healthcare. That's yeah. it. We, we are, we're going to wrap this up. The only thing I would say is Ernie, our producer, we were talking about at some point we'll have Representative Ted Lu on again. We've had him a number of times. And I think Ernie, one of these times we should just do a whole thing with Ted or any other political leader we talk to about this. Just forget everything else. And let's let's talk about this with um, people who are in a position to make a difference. And the other thing I think is, is we do things with people like the Women's Business Collaborative, the mm-hmm. WBC and others. Oh, absolutely. We yeah. ought to double back and again, just say, okay, today, this is all we're going to be talking about and have you both or one or both of you and or someone else you might recommend on to talk with some folks, maybe flip the the role here and say, why don't you co-host and help me ask some questions of Ted or people like that? Let's just do some stuff on this, Ernie. I know you 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 you're hearing this uh, because let's let's not leave it here um, and just keep pushing this one. So anyway, um, everybody who listens to this anywhere, I just want to tell you this has been in conversation with Frank Schaefer. Um, there will be links to Morehouse, to Taya, to Karen, to everything they do um, so that you can follow up with them. If you want to find out more, uh, we'll put up any links you all want us to. And I just want to thank you for taking the time again and say we will continue to follow this up if you will help us do that uh, mm-hmm. and just keep, keep pushing on this one. So thank you for everything you do. Thank you for being with us today. And it's lovely talking to you. Thank you, Frank. Um, Thank you, Frank. Yeah. We appreciate you so much. You. Well, same here. And much love to you both and Godspeed with what you're doing. Thank right. you. Same to you. Bye, sister. <laughs> Bye, sister. Bye.